and a warning shot to corporate America from President-elect Donald Trump. The man who campaigned on the promise to defend the American worker says any company that offshores American jobs, takes them out of the country, will pay a price. Mr. Trump says cuts in taxes and regulations will spur economic growth, jobs, and profits. But he warns any companies which outsource those jobs but then try to bring back their products to sell inside the United States will get hit with a massive tariff. The threat is not sitting well with many in Washington, including some Republicans. Nebraska Senator Ben Sass hit social media and tweeted this. President-elect Trump means well, but won't his 35% tariff idea raise prices on American families? How would it not be a new 35% tax on families, he asks. Our Brian Yannis is live outside Trump Tower in New York City. A bustling area during this holiday season and people on those sidewalks talking politics and economics tonight, Brian. <laughs> Good evening, Harris. You know, timing here matters when it comes to what you were talking about with Trump's tweets. Given that it was just a couple of days ago that he was able to successfully keep some 1,000 jobs from being shipped over to Mexico from Indiana in that Carrier United Technologies deal. I mean, it's a big, that was a big victory for Mr. Trump, considering that he was able to say that he was living up to a campaign promise before even being inaugurated. Now, the thing with that is, though, that this deal with Carrier... Uh, was bent on giving a seven million dollar tax break to the company and some wondered if this deal meant Mr. Trump wasn't serious about imposing harsh penalties and whether this was going to be more of the same backroom dealing well this morning he reiterated that he would impose a 35 percent tariff on products from companies who outsource jobs to Mexico tweeting quote this tax will make leaving financially difficult but these companies are able to move between all 50 states with no tax or tariff being charged Please be forewarned prior to making a very expensive mistake. The United States is open for business. And earlier today on Fox and Friends, Ryan Priebus, the White House chief of staff, said, look, companies can expect more personal calls from Mr. Trump. Harris? Interesting. So I understand that Mr. Trump also called out the Rexnord Corporation. And I did some digging, a little looking at them. They're a multi-platform industrial company, employ a lot of people. What are the people who work there saying? Exactly right. Well, the next Rexnord Corporation is based out of Milwaukee, and they made plans in October that they announced they were going to send some 300 jobs from Indianapolis to Mexico. Well, Trump called them out on Twitter on Friday, and an employee earlier today on Fox and Friends who had been there for 10 years says that the company expects him to train his counterpart, who is a Mexican. Listen. There's a provision in there, uh, apparently, that for us to get our severance package or retirement package or any kind of money that yes uh the requirement will be that we'll have to train our counterparts to do the exact job that we're doing right now how does that make you feel sick to my stomach mr beeman when asked if he if if he believed that trump would save his job he says yes harris this was a huge issue for then candidate Donald Trump. And so delivering on this, you see, in that one corporation, people are waiting to see what that delivery system will look like. Uh, so let's move now from the economy to foreign policy because there's been some other news cooking on that. The president elect sent a message to China today. Tell us about that, Brian. Well, of course, this comes after Taiwan and the president-elect. The Taiwan leader and the president-elect spoke on Friday when the Taiwan leader called the president-elect in a congratulatory call. Well, China wasn't too pleased about that call and filed a formal complaint on Saturday warning the United States to act with care and caution. Of course, China, when it comes to Taiwan, it's a very hypersensitive topic. China believes Taiwan is a territory, territory of theirs. Taiwan believes they're a sovereign nation. So, given that context and given the fact that he's talking about the economy some wondered if Mr. Trump if this call meant that he was going to be a little bit more aggressive towards China while well, in a tweet tonight he says did China ask us if it was okay to devalue their currency making it hard for our companies to compete heavily tax our products going into their country the US doesn't tax them or to build a massive military complex in the middle of the South China Sea I don't think so Mr. Trump there, at least implying that, one, he's going to be more aggressive, and two, he doesn't really need to ask China for permission to do anything. Harris? All right. That's what he said he would do. We'll continue to cover the news as it happens. Brian Yanis, always good to see you. Thank you. Outside Trump Tower.
with me. I, I want to go now to Ambassador Christopher Hill. Joining me on the phone, he was the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific Affairs under President George W. Bush. Ambassador Hill, when you heard this, what was your reaction? Should Trump have had this conversation with the President of Taiwan? Well, obviously, he should not have. We have had for 40 years rather clear policies of how to implement the One China policy. Eight years during the Reagan administration, this never happened. Four years during the uh, Bush senior administration, this never happened. Eight years of Clinton, eight years of George W. Bush, and eight years of Obama. So this is a real break. Obviously, it was a it was uh, an example of what is all too often happening now with this incoming administration, this tendency to wing it. What I'm concerned about is that rather than acknowledge a mistake, uh, they will double down on it and say that this is indeed an effort to change some of the terms of our one China yeah. policy. And that's a huge mistake. We have a lot of stuff going on with China. We've got well, South China Sea. We've got North Korea. We don't need this right and, now. And Ambassador, you know, to your point about them doubling down, this was not a mistake. I mean, we know a pro-Taiwan advisor of Trump's team who worked closely with Dick Cheney facilitated this phone call, right? It was purposeful. We know no one in the Trump camp consulted the White House or the State Department before the phone call was made. Was it done on purpose in secret? Well, I, I, I do know the individual you're talking about, Steve Yates. He, uh, he worked for Dick Cheney, and he worked on Taiwan, and he, you know, beavered away with really a concept that there was no such thing as the People's Republic of China. Well, there is, and this shouldn't have been done. And uh, whether it was Steve Yates trying to organize this, there should have been someone in the transition, perhaps the National Security Advisor, say, wait a minute, let's uh, think this through. And clearly, there's just too much of this kind of winging it and this kind of deinstitutionalization that's going on. That is, why ask the State Department? Why ask the National Security Council staff? Uh, why not just go ahead because it feels right? And this is not going to be the uh, last of these kinds of things. So uh, things need to get cleaned up and cleaned up in a hurry in Washington. Ambassador Hill, well, thank I you. Thank you very much uh, for your time. And, you know, <laughs> one of the things that I've really been struck by in the news conference of all the appointees this week is that many of them are, well, the political headline was Team of Gazillionaires. And it's true that many of the people that Donald Trump has tapped are either billionaires or multimillionaires. In other words, they're pretty rich. Um, let's look at a little bit of the media chatter on this subject. Billionaire investor Wilbur Ross tapped for Commerce Secretary. Todd Ricketts, whose billionaire family owns the Chicago Cubs, Deputy Commerce Secretary. Sensing a pattern here? The administration is starting to staff up with its top names. It's turning into quite a full employment program for the nation's billionaires. So the Washington Post has a whole piece on this on the front page. Their collective wealth in many ways defies Trump's populist campaign promises. So because they're successful businessmen and have made a lot of money, they're going to be anti-populist? Is that a fair assumption? Uh, it may prove not to be a fair assumption, but it's not a totally unreasonable uh, assumption on which to base a news story right now at this point in time, I don't think. I mean, uh, JFK, well, uh, FDR were pretty yeah, rich guys sure, who sure, certainly yeah. did a lot for the American middle class. Yeah, they were. But, you know, I mean, the, the, the JFK's or uh, FDR's uh, labor secretary was Frances Perkins. She wasn't a rich person. I mean, you know, the, this, uh, you know, all these cabinet people are rich in both administrations, uh, both parties. That is certainly true. Trump, Trump talked a very, very different game. That's fair. Obama's ambassador appointments were mostly donors. I didn't see the collective yeah, media. <laughs> Free and Obama had more than any past president. And President Obama's commerce secretary, Penny Pritzker, comes from the Hyatt family, worth about two and a half billion dollars or something like that. So, is there an assumption? And by the way, if these people uh, carry out policies that do favor their wealthy friends and try to stick it to the middle class, then I think the press should hold them accountable. But they haven't taken office yet. So, is there an assumption when it's uh, Republicans, which Republicans, that it's a little different? Uh, of course, there always is a different um, presumption of incompetence given to Republicans. But I think also the American people, people elected a billionaire president. They elected someone who was a current business person. This idea that he was suddenly supposed to, you know, shake off all business ties to his own business, that he was never going to appoint someone who he knew through his business ties, uh, that's not what the American people said on Election Day. I think until he starts, as you said, yeah. actually taking actions in one direction or another, the media needs to take a deep breath and find a new way to cover him. You know, uh, the president-elect talked about seeing a report, it was actually on NBC Nightly News, about uh, people at the carrier air conditioner plant 
uh, saying they thought he had promised to save their jobs. But the great symbolism of what he did there, whether you think it was a good deal or not, the thousand jobs. Just to come back to that flag burning tweet, it actually happened after Trump saw a Fox News report about a college in Massachusetts where some students who were opposed to Trump's election had burned the flag. So it wasn't completely out of the blue. Uh, so just to wrap up here on his use of Twitter, I mean, sometimes he gets to set the agenda. Presidents tend to have a pretty good megaphone. That's right. Again, though, with that particular tweet, that has the precedent has been set by the court on flag burning. And it so he's being provocative. Maybe yeah. he, doesn't, he didn't say, I will propose on my first day in office. He said, I think they should go to jail if they burn the flag. A lot of people would agree. It could be that some of these tweets stop once he is the president. Kellyanne Conway was asked this morning if these tweets would continue once he's in office, and she said that's up to him and the Secret Service. Well, he can appoint the Secret Service head he wants.